Okay, so let's go find a um, post from the group. I haven't had a chance to look at the group today, so we're gonna, we'll go look at it together. Here, I'll just share my screen and we can, we can just go find a post together. Look, here's my Facebook memory. That's a really pretty picture. That's when my hair used to be short. It's really, really long now. I have it like tucked into this thing here. <laughs> um, all right, so let's go to um, the group and see what's cooking. Looks like um, Tina Hargaden is live now. And it looks like Teresa's here and one other person. So hello, you guys. Um, let's see. I don't have any resources for Felipe Alu, Julie, so I'm going to skip that. But it looks like you got Sarah. Um, let's see. I think I'm going to skip that one. Running dictation can be done remotely. Ooh, look, Kara answered that question. That's great. Um, and here's a dance. That's awesome. And there's me saying I'll be live. So that's awesome. Okay. So um, there was actually this really interesting discussion going on about this post right here. So it says, um, this is Krista post. And uh, she's like just sharing it, right? And she's like, some of the greatest teachers of all time taught virtually. So um, I don't know these two people. Maybe I just missed out on that part of the 70s or 60s or whenever that was. But um, there were so many interesting discussions down here. So um, Jennifer was like, they had script writers and cameramen and retakes and everything. Um, zero accountability, like they had a budget, they didn't have to do all this stuff. Um, that we have to do and comparing what they did to remote learning is insulting to teachers. And then Robin's like, they also had catered lunches and stuff like that. So let's see what Tony said. Um, it's a nice thought, but it's just more toxic positivity. It's supposed to inspire, but it just dismisses the unreasonable and unsustainable workload and poor working conditions that we're actually dealing with or learning conditions. But the Oregon Education Association, my well, my former union, um, said teachers working conditions are students learning conditions. That was like our rallying cry. So it's true that if we have crap working conditions and we're stressed and we're overloaded that the students are going to have bad learning conditions because like if you don't take care, it's like if you don't have your air mask on or your oxygen mask on, you know, in the airplane going down into the ocean, <laughs> you can't save anybody else. So it, it is true that like bad working conditions lead to bad learning conditions. Um, so Tony's like, sorry to react so negatively to something with positive intent, but we got to push back on the feel good rhetoric. So yes, Tony, I totally agree. Um, let's see, getting a lot of yeses. Um, let me see other stuff. I'm grasping at straws. Ooh, great. So let's see. Dude, I do love a post or a comment where somebody's going to go all caps on us here because obviously you're feeling pretty uh, strong about this. So let's see what Grace says. I agree with the toxic positivity message, but I am grasping at straws because my district has been in person this entire year with dishonesty about COVID cases. This is just going to make me so mad. And I just don't feel safe. And I want to be full remote so bad. This is a toxic environment. I think I've gotten like six or seven emails this week and less of 400 come into the building because full remote was offered to students, but never to faculty. Grace, that is really tragic. I am really sad to hear that. Um, I, I can't imagine, like I, I keep thinking about how before the pandemic, we were already like at our breaking point. I mean, my whole goal as working with teachers is to like help teachers simplify things down <laughs> and have systems that um, make their job easier because our jobs are way too hard. Um, and like my personal experience as a teacher was that my first year I was a hot mess. I mean, most people are kind of a hot mess their first year, but 
I really had no sense of direction. Um, and I was making everything way too hard. And I was like building everything from scratch and with like no direction. So I was just constantly reinventing everything. And I was just make, it was like make work for myself. But then I went to senior college. I've told the story a million times. Um, and, and they gave me like my sanity back. And <laughs> I honestly don't know if I would have been a teacher for as long as I taught without that because it's not because like like I, I probably if I couldn't find something that made teaching easier for me I probably wouldn't have been able to sustain the stress load and I have actually heard people say that um here I'm just gonna stop sharing because I want to talk to you guys um <clears throat> like I've actually heard people say this is gross that oh, I'm sorry nasty um that like the people that quit education are not like the poor te not, <laughs> i'm not talking financially poor i'm talking like the less engaged and less committed i guess and less like talented teachers like you would think that those are the people that give up and quit you know because they're like not in it to win it but statistically actually it's teachers who really care so teachers like yourself who are watching a video of another teacher that you might have never even met talking about teaching on a Friday evening, that kind of teacher, teachers like you and me. So those are the teachers that end up quitting in more numbers than the teachers that are just kind of like in it for a paycheck, I guess, which I don't know who's in it for a paycheck, but I guess there's some of them. Um, and I don't know how they determine like the quality of the teachers that were leaving, but, um, and I can totally see that because like for myself, I was totally adrift my, my first year and I, I completely didn't know where I was going or really kind of what I was doing. But I knew that like I, I had a big vision uh, for my teaching, you know? And so that like kept me working so much. Um, and I was like working myself into the ground. I used to like take the max train, like our light rail um, out to Gresham which is like 17 miles away by car. Um, so it was like the last stop way out in Gresham and I would get to school at like 6.30 a.m. So that means I was like leaving my house at like 4.45 or something like that. I would get there super, super early and I would leave super, super late and I would just work all weekend. I used to work at the market, like the farmer's market. Um, I, I did a bunch of different things at the farmer's market. I used to actually work at a organic, farm <laughs> it was like one of my first jobs out here um and I actually really like that kind of stuff too but um I used to yeah, I remember being at the market and at this point I was like I worked for this lady named Nancy who I was selling goat cheese for her and so I'd be sitting there selling my goat cheese but I like had like stacks of my kids like papers um and the market only lasted till about like right now in the year so it was always like that that fall time and they would be writing like their personal narratives. And so I'd have like all these personal narratives and I'd like bring stacks of their like writer's notebooks to the market after I'd worked like I just described all week, you know? And while I was commuting back and forth, this like hour long trip on the max train, I would be sitting there like responding to their little journals and everything. So I was like working myself into the ground and, um, and I wasn't feeling very effective. So like, if you care a lot, and you're working really hard and you don't feel like you're effective, that's like a recipe for dissatisfaction and, and burnout. And, and then of course, you know, my whole teaching career really um, has, has been, this is maybe a little political for people, but we've really been defunding and like pulling resources out of um, free public education um, and putting them into like corporate hands. Um, and there's there's a big push for that to to like I, I'm assuming there's like some business folks out there who are looking at like the government expenditures and thinking like why isn't that money flowing into the private sector you know we should really like privatize education and then we can take all that cash and put it in the hands of the corporations um, probably they're like namely my corporation <laughs> um, so like my whole teaching career has been like that 
era, I guess. Um, and it, it just it, it's been getting like worse and worse. Like it's not getting it wasn't getting better even before the pandemic. So now, like we've, we've been doing more and more with less and less for at least 17 years um, since I've been teaching. And then on top of this like gradual and sometimes precipitous de defunding of, of education and like deprofessionalizing of teaching um, and, and like, like bad mouthing the profession of lazy teachers and all, all this bad stuff has been happening to our profession. And then on top of that, now we've got this whole COVID thing and, and then that's been politicized as well. And so like some people, some districts and schools and administrators and school boards are just like not at all willing to, um, I don't know, kind of like look at the reality of what's going on for some reason. And they're like forcing us or forcing a lot of you guys because I'm <laughs> somehow had this kind of good timing in my life because I kind of thought I might go back to school this year, but I didn't really like apply for very many jobs in like April, you know, when the jobs all come out because I kind of thought it was going to be a mess. So I'm kind of sitting this one out and just like making a bunch of curriculum, but um, that's fine <laughs> with me. Um, but what I'm saying is like, if, if you're teaching right now and you're dealing with the pandemic, it, it's not just the pandemic. It's all of the de two decades before, maybe even three, um, where our jobs are getting more and more untenable anyway. Um, so I really feel like I really, really do. Um, my advice would be, this is probably the year to take a lot of your sick days. Like, this has always been my thinking. If you can take a sick day to go get a flu shot or have, you know, take half a sick day to go have a doctor's appointment and have a checkup or something like that, then you should be able to feel pretty good about taking a sick day to like prioritize your health because getting a flu shot is prioritizing your health and maybe taking a bath and decompressing um, when you just can't do it anymore is also prioritizing your health. So I really hope that people have like ratcheted down what they um, expect of themselves right now. And I know it's really hard. And that's why I think so many of like the super dedicated teachers are the ones who end up not being able to maintain um, what their, what teaching is like these days. Like when I was a kid, um, I went to kindergarten in 1980. So I don't, I don't think teaching was, I mean, I was a kid, right? So I was just watching it as a kid, but it really just, to me, like I knew I wanted to be a teacher since the day I went to kindergarten. And, uh, and it just looked so fun, you know, like teachers made it look super fun back then. Like it was just this creative enterprise where they were like building this world um, for our en enjoyment and betterment. Um, and I was always like really motivated to do that. Um, and actually that's why I like worked so hard to transition from teaching language arts and social studies to teaching language because even if we're dealing with like colleagues and administrators who like don't really understand the, the standards and like the goals of like a proficiency based teaching or communication based teaching. Um, we really generally, I mean, not every situation is going to be the same, but um, generally have less sort of oversight and, and there's not quite as many fingers that want to get into our pie because most of us are not like a tested subject. Right. So like being in that, tested subject of, of language arts, I, I really was really aware of how how much pressure was building for like the teaching to the test mentality and like adequate yearly progress. I, I don't know if we still have that anymore, but we used to. Um, and, and like test scores, test scores. And like, that's what administrators are getting pressure on them for, you know, to improve those. And so then they're like putting pressure on the teacher. Um, and, and so like when, you know, when all the like creativity is like sucked out of this thing, that's like this deep passion for you, like on this like deep level of your soul, you know, um, and, and, and you feel like there's just this like film between you and like this job you truly want to do. Um, and, and then I, I just, I, I know that like sometimes teaching, it's like this conduit like opens up and you're like in the promised land and it's just like, it, it's like addictive. I mean, I don't know if you guys feel that way, but I do. Like, 
it's it's like a rush you know it's like a legal high um when it's going well and for me like honestly 92 percent i may be even 93 and a half percent maybe even up to 94 <laughs> percent i'm just completely making this up but the vast majority of like my class periods and my days in, in the school building were like fantastic and lots of fun um even teaching language arts I, I i kind of never took it too seriously um that i was like supposed to care so much about the test scores and stuff like that and i'm lucky because i live in a really strong union environment and so like if you don't live in a super strong union environment or maybe like some states unions seem like they're almost practically illegal now and you don't have a lot of protections and like you could get fired out a whim or like your pay is based on test scores or like you might get put on plan or something if the test scores aren't so great. Um, I, so I was really fortunate because like we have super strong representation and agreements um, with our unions out here. And so we have a lot of freedom, but even so it was still getting, it, I could feel it like eroding away. Um, and, and now we, so on just, it's not like we went back to like the good old days of teaching. like we we kind of did most of us did in march april and may and june right like there there it seems like there was this like little like crack in the system that kind of opened up and everybody was like realizing for about five weeks the entire like kind of nation was of the same mind that this was like a life-changing situation you know that we're in and it was and i i remember thinking like maybe my dream is going to come true and like everybody's just going to wake up and realize that you know it's all about teaching people and like giving people what they need and maybe what they need isn't the next thing in chapter three but but like we're we, we had this moment where it was like this possible it was a horrible moment right it was like this horrible pandemic but like there was this little hope that that they were going to back off of us because like a lot of schools weren't giving grades anymore and like if schools stopped giving grades for good i would i would i could just like hang up my hat and just go back to the classroom and have a good old time you know um so that it was like this this great moment that was also horrible <laughs> but that it, it the the clouds came back and <laughs> reality set back in and and so like what happened is that like this new reality stepped back in on top of like all this accountability and stuff like that and so we're being asked to like keep accountable mo most of us i think to keep accountable and, and and make sure that we're like collecting data and all this stuff which was hard enough anyway on on top of like just one just, just all the human suffering that everybody's going through right now and, and two having to learn all these new tricks and I mean, let's be honest, like, ain't none of us a spring chicken. So like, we're all old dogs and we're all having to learn new tricks. And the students are young dogs, but they're having to learn a bunch of new tricks too. I mean, even if you're a young dog, you can only learn so many tricks in one week. Um, and so we're all just like super stressed, but like the accountability came back because in the spring, I don't, I don't know if you felt this way, but I kind of did, it was like horrible, but it was also kind of like this creative challenge, like, okay. I'm gonna see what I can do, you know, like, and then there was also this whole teachers are heroes, you know, like, and, and it's like, yeah, we're awesome. We're saving the world. And, and we could also have like, well, there's the Rose City moving and storage going by, they're kind of loud. But um, Portland is the Rose City <laughs> or um, some people say Rip City. <laughs> And nobody knows apparently why Portland is called Rip City. It was the, the lore that I have heard is that like in the 90s at a Trailblazers game, um, somebody yelled out the words Rip City and it just like took the Rose City Memorial Coliseum by storm and it just stuck. I don't know why, I, I wasn't here in the mid 90s. So I can't speak to anything that happened around here before 1999. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's, I was just gonna say it's it's really difficult, but it but like it I think it's important for us to not just pin all the the difficulty on the pandemic because for me 
and and I, I think this feeds into that whole like only the good die young um thing with the teachers quitting the profession um it's not just the pandemic and, it, and if we just start to blame all our woes on the pandemic then we're gonna miss like I personally think we should be looking for every opportunity myself to kind of get in there and and like reopen those clouds again as much as, as we can because maybe there will be like I mean, I'm sure there'll be a new normal someday but you know maybe that would be a little less accountability and like punitive stuff and a little more like the fun of learning you know and being in a community with fellow citizens of your town or neighborhood I mean school is a really like beautiful thing right it's like this group of people comes together it's kind of random it's kind of just like based on geography or whatever or school choice I don't know like you're a kid right so like your parents send you to the place they send you to school to and you're just like I go to you know Montclair High um, you know you don't usually have much of an input in it um but then like you know what the good like the really good teachers do is like they take this group of like crazy folk who came from all and not crazy but like it's just you know this crazy assortment of people that like makes no sense and they make it into like a functioning community um it's it's really great but then of course you know like i said there's all this film in the way so we don't always get to just enjoy all that um let's just read more of this um exciting like thread here steve Irwin did die on the job i i was refused to teach virtually from home yeah that made me mad um they're all men and the majority of classroom teachers are women that is true um so stephanie says i take it as a rejoinder to the negative blanket statements out there that online learning doesn't work yes so stephanie i i, I agree i mean I understand, obviously, because I just kind of like talked about it the whole time I was supposed to be doing the Facebook Live. Um, I totally understand the, like, the bitterness, you know, that would, that I feel too when I see stuff like this. Like, oh yeah, that's pretty glib. Like, oh yeah, yeah, just be like Mr. Rogers, you know. Um, but I, I did find when I was like first experimenting with stuff online that even like with asynchronous lessons that I was like playing around with um that there were ways to like interact with the kids and I did actually like in my own brain before I even saw this meme kind of realize like that I felt kind of like Mr. Rogers probably would have felt like I loved Mr. Rogers when I was a kid and um my husband's brother is a priest and he went to seminary in uh, Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is, I guess, very close to where Mr. Rogers lived. Um, and he met him because Mr. Rogers was not Catholic, but some other denomination. Uh, but he was a pastor too, I think. So he came and spoke at the seminary that Kevin went to. But anyways, um, I love Mr. Rogers and and I loved his show when, when I was a kid. And then I went to see his movie. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen Mr. Rogers movie. It's like such a tearjerker. Ooh -wee. Um, I also went to see the, the new Little Women on the same weekend last year with my mom and my sister. And I was like bawling at the end of Little Women, the new one. I, I've, I've been a big, huge fan of Little Women my entire life, but I've never bawled um, ever. Maybe I'm just getting old or something. I don't know. Um, it was like when when Joe like goes, I'm gonna like cry again. I'm just thinking about it. But at the very end of this version of Little Women, like Joe is writing Little Women <laughs> because like Louisa May Alcott was basically writing about herself and her life when she wrote Little Women. So anyway, Joe like has this big book that she's gonna write, and she like goes up to the attic and and she's just like writing all night. And like I've never seen a scene like this in any like portrayal of little women she's just like writing and writing and, and she looks like she's kind of like in pain and I was just like bawling in the theater and like nobody else around me was bawling um so nobody else apparently thought it was like a tearjerker but but I did and I think it was because um I, I just felt like I understood what she was feeling like because I felt that way before too like I've worked all night 
before writing things um, that I thought were important to get out there. My, my own things that I write are not like cute stories. <laughs> I mean, Little Women's not just a cute story. It's a very important book to me. So it's got a lot in it, but um, you know, it's like a fictional account that was written for young girls. And that's not what I'm exactly writing. I mean, I'm writing like long winded terms about what I think about teaching, but it still feels the same way. Um, and so I was just like crying <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling like a weirdo, but I often feel like a weirdo, so that's all right. Um, but anyway, yeah, I was watching the Mr. Rogers movie um, and I love Mr. Rogers. And I didn't know that much about his personal life, but I love him even more now that I know about his personal life. And um, when I when I was doing like my first kind of asynchronous uh, experimentation, I um, was like, I, I kind of feel like Mr. Rogers because like I'm I'm kind of using that like caretaker speech, you know, because that's what we do when we teach with CI, especially teachers of all subjects. You know, we, we do this like caretaker speech, right? Because like, we're communicating with the young. Um, and, and so like, he was super good at that. And um, I was like, I, I remembered that when I was a kid, you know, I always felt this like connection with Mr. Rogers, like his, his talent, I suppose is, well, number one, he, uh, Chris Stoltz one time on Ben Slavic's blog shared this um, statistic that um stuck with ben and then he stuck it on to me so stuck with me too that um mr rogers like one of his talents is that he speaks with the pacing that a child actually needs adults to speak at so like he speaks really slowly and calmly and like kids eat out of his hand and like the reason that chris was sharing that on Ben's PLC that he, I think still has actually, um, was that that's, you know, what we're kind of going for too with, with CI, like we need to be speaking really slowly, probably a little more slowly actually than Mr. Rogers. But um, I, I started to see that like, there actually is a way like to make online learning feel not like the same as being in the classroom, but like still have that personal connection. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm also with you, uh, Stephanie, um, because I, th I think that's the intent of this, of this meme, but um, it, yeah, like, you know, when you're feeling down, like everything feels like a more hurtful, you know, and we're feeling really down right now. I mean, I'm not even teaching and I feel super down, like, it's, it's really hard um, these days. <sighs> I don't mean to be a negative Nelly, and I am going to go in like one minute, but um, I just want to say something to you guys that I, it kind of occurred to me the other day. I don't want us to all be thinking that like 2020 is the cursed time that like when it's over everything's going to be fine again and like when the calendar page turns in like seven weeks or five or six i don't know how many um i don't like math <laughs> anyway like when we turn the page to 2021 i don't want us to be like getting our hopes up that that like things are going to be any better than they are now they're, they're, they're probably going to be worse because i don't i'm sure you guys have seen the the pandemic, you know, trend line, it's trending up very steeply, especially um, in the Midwest. So, and I live in the West, right? So we're, we're always kind of low, but I don't know. I kind of wonder about it. Cause like the Northeast had a, a, a big run, most states, not Vermont, Vermont's doing very well. Good job, Vermont. Um, and then the South had like a big run and now the Midwest, and I'm like, hmm, is the West so much better at locking down? And well, California had a big run too, but like my little pocket of, of the West, I guess, is, is kind of, hasn't had a huge spike, but maybe it's like we haven't had a huge spike yet. Maybe we're not like just so great at managing the pandemic. Maybe it's just hasn't kind of traveled up here yet. I, I don't know. I've been kind of surprised though, because like 
you know, on March 12th, when I came, this is like this mythical day for me at this point, because it's like the last thing I did on March 12th, I was, I, my mom and I had gone to an Island in Washington called Orcas Island. If you've ever been to Orcas Island, you should leave a comment because it's a very magical place. If you've ever been to Doe Bay on Orcas Island, you should let me know. It's like my favorite place on earth. So, um, we were coming back on the 12th of March. We'd gone up there for like nine days, I think, um, to stay in this cabin and it was great. Um, and then like, as we were up there, so we were up there for like March 2nd to March 12th. And then we were coming. So like, as we were up there, like the pandemic kind of started ramping up in people's consciousnesses, consciousnesses. <laughs> and we had to come back to Portland from above Seattle and so we had to drive through Seattle and like, that's where like this first kind of like big hot spot had broken out in the, in the States. And, uh, but even though like that was this, this big outbreak at the very beginning, uh, we in Oregon, especially have like kind of escaped it. So hopefully that'll continue, but I don't know. I was looking at the, I, I found this graphic that like showed like over time, like how the Northeast was up and then the South was up and now the Midwest is up and the West kind of has just been staying like this. And I'm like, maybe we're coming up to come up. And so I kind of just thought to myself, like, I'm going to kind of double down on the not seeing anybody stuff. <laughs> but you know, like twice zero is still zero. So <laughs> I'm like doubling down, but still <laughs> that would be about the same. <laughs> I like, I literally haven't done anything since March 12th. <laughs> Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's over time. I said I would be going in a minute. It's, it's four minutes later. So I don't want to keep you guys. And um, I just, I think it's really fun to like be on Facebook again. Um, I just I kind of turned a corner. I was like, I was like, I could do this every day. I was actually thinking about how I used to go into school um, and like do a Facebook or no, it, it was a, a YouTube, right? Like I would, it wasn't on YouTube. I don't, I don't think YouTube live was a thing back then. Cause if it was, that would have been good. But I, I think I maybe wouldn't have wanted to be like live streaming directly from room 22. Like that might've been a little weird, but <laughs> you never know what might happen on that live stream. Um, <laughs> but it was so fun. Like to just have this like purpose every day. Like, you know, every day I'm gonna like put this video out there. And like at first I, I didn't think anybody was even like watching it. I just thought like, oh, it'll be a repository. Maybe I can use it one day. But, but then I started getting like messages from people that were like watching my classes. Like they were like watching it every day. Um, and that, that kind of gave me this like, it was like I'd go to school and I always enjoyed going to school. I, mean, I didn't always enjoy going to school exactly, but I enjoyed being in the classroom with the kids. <laughs> like the commute to school, I never really relished, you know? And you know the staff meetings weren't exactly like primo, um, and sometimes they'd be somewhat fun, but not always, <laughs> not most of the time. But you know, being in the classroom, I always enjoyed mostly. But um, yeah, it like took this thing that was already fun, and it made it like extra fun because I like had this other purpose. And, and then I quickly realized that people were like actually watching these videos and like enjoying them or finding some kind of value in them. So I was like, I was like, I could just do that again. I could just like go on Facebook every day instead of going into my classroom every day. I don't know, who knows? Maybe I'll keep it up. I'm on a two day roll. So maybe, maybe I'll come back on Monday and roll some more. <laughs> um, I do, before we go though, I, I had planned on talking about this a little bit, but uh, the, um, I know I said I was going to go. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm so dangerous these days because I don't really have too much else going on in my life. <laughs> um, I just wanted to show you guys um, this. Okay, hang on. Downloads. This thing that I just made because I'm really into it. So I, um, yeah, I think this is part of it. Yeah, so like this is for a training that I'm making for people that are writing the text for ELIT. Um, and it's all about um, cognates. And you can tell me in the comments, okay, if you if you know this concept, if, if you've had trainings on it and stuff like that, um, about like different tiers or types of vocabulary words. So like tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, and there's another 
there's another like graphic that like goes ahead of this. Let's see. Yeah, I'm like working on this big like training thing. So um, I just want to find the one with the vocab words on it. Well, sorry, you guys. Let me just, I'm just going to try to do my best to find it here for you. Okay, if you're watching still <laughs> and you have this experience of like, you're on the computer and like you know that like if you weren't in front of people you could like do this thing that you want to do like it would be so easy to like find the file if you were just like sitting there like on your computer by yourself but like because you know people are watching your computer and they're watching you interact with it you're like oh god i'm such an idiot like i'm so embarrassed i can't even find the file and then you start beating yourself up on the inside um this is like a pandemic thing okay so what i was talking about um, in this training for the writers, because like the whole purpose of this is to make the text like this is for level one text. So the very basic text for the very beginners. <clears throat> and so like the purpose is to make it super duper comprehensible. And I really do feel like a lot of us think um, like we look at all these cognates, right? Like we, we see like voyage and we're like, well, that's just like the word voyage. Or we see like liberté and we're like, well, that's just like liberty. Um, or like sentiment, it's like sentiment. And then over here, it's like practically sentiment. But these, I would say, um, maybe not are, they're maybe not technically tier two, like the way the official definition of tier two is, but I would say that they're not like this tier one, which is just like your everyday language that people will just pick up from just like being alive, you know, like, okay, train and train. Yeah. Like I can expect that if a kid sees the word train, they're going to know the word train. But like if they see the word sentiment and they don't know the word sentiments in English, which I would say that depending on your family background, probably the word sentiments doesn't come up a lot around your household. Um, probably feelings would, would be, and that's probably a Germanic root because a lot of our like everyday words in English come from German or Anglo-Saxon, I suppose. So the Germanic language, but um. So like sentiment, even though to us, like as teachers, because we're like educated folks, right? We have a big vocabulary. We think like sentiment is easy and they should be able to see the word sentiments in there, but they, they don't always. And even this word like station service, like service station, I guess I'm maybe not going to know that because like, what did I say over here? This is like an explanation of like, why isn't it um, a tier one word? I said service station. Service station then is perhaps well known to us oldsters, but like, you know, students aren't maybe going to know it. So the whole idea here is like just to kind of reinforce for the writers that like the word circulation is not necessarily going to be apparent to the kid, especially because in French, like circulation is like trafico in, in Spanish. So like trafico and traffic, they're like pretty direct. Like trafico, I would say you'd say French or Spanish cognate trafico and English would be tier one traffic. But like voyage or um, circulation, I mean, if you know the word circulation, you're like, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Like when I learned the word circulation in high school, I was like, oh, that makes sense. It's like circulation, like a lot of circulation, people are circulating around the town. But that's because I knew that word. <laughs> if you don't know that word, the word circulation is not a cognate. So I just thought I'd share that. Um, it's, it's something that I feel really strongly about because I think like where it says over here, like put your brain in your student's brain shoes I was gonna say put your brain in your student's shoes, but like it's it's not their shoes exactly. It's like their brain's shoes. If their brain doesn't recognize these things in English, they're the the word that you're trying to use in the language is still foreign. And I do mean foreign in the in the sense of like alien to them, right? Like I don't call myself a foreign language teacher, but the concept of it being foreign to their mind. Um, it's it's still foreign to them. Um, it's it, so it's just you know you got just gotta think about it. And especially I would say just to bring it full circle here, and then I am gonna go, um, is that you know in the pandemic, like if you're teaching virtually or even if you're teaching like hybrid and it's just crazy you know going on in your class right now, um, we we probably all could have been more comprehensible even before 
we started this um, interesting phase of history. But now I think we really need to like ramp it down. <laughs> like we need to get down to the basics. So these like words that we're, we can be pretty sure that, you know, even the, the very low academic vocab having kids can, um, you know, comprehend. <laughs> that's the, that's why we call it comprehensible input. <laughs> We do want them to comprehend it. <laughs> well, anyway, you guys, uh, maybe I'll just come back on Monday and wish some more. <laughs> Not wish, just, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm kind of, kind of uh, holding forth, I suppose. <laughs> um, anyway, thanks for coming and um, have a good weekend. And it's sunny here right now, so I'm happy about that. I hope it's sunny tomorrow where you are. Bye.